been so long since like we've like hung out and talked and this is kind of a weird way to do it but um it's really been fun it's, it's so bizarre but yeah. i'm so glad to see your face and hear your voice well i'm all face my Look face great. ends right about there all right but but um first things first happy birthday um you know, oh, I know it was yesterday and uh tomorrow's heather's birthday so we're just going to celebrate your birthday right now just for a second and happy birthday okay so uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we got you know it's it's uh we're getting back towards getting into skating you know and and the lifeline for all of us in the skating academy and for you know our coaches and for um you know all of our skaters has been zoom you know they've been doing classes and mental training and stretch classes and jumping and i even did a exercise class for our three-year-old learn to skate class one time which was really fun and, you know i read them dr seuss at the end and you know just whatever we can do to keep people busy what have you been doing during this time to keep yourself busy well to your point we've been trying our best to stay busy and stay fit uh, yeah. so my you look very fit yeah well, my wife never, she will avoid a staircase. I mean, she doesn't even walk. She hates exercise so much. And when we were overseas, because we spent eight months overseas between Europe and Asia, uh, wow. we started playing tennis. So we would play tennis almost every day. Uh, and she, and then I realized she's actually a great athlete. She's very fit um, and she's very sporty. So we started working out a little bit at a time with these like YouTube at home workout videos. <laughs> yeah. that I let her choose because this yeah. was, you know, it, she's a beginner and she was new at the workout thing. And she found all of these like aerobics and mm. like step classes and, <laughs> um, and I love it, man. I love it so much. Now I do them all. I do. I find videos and do them every day. Like, choose what I want to work on arms or core or legs. And there are some great resources on YouTube just to find people that have a background in, in fitness or exercise physiology. And I found some really good ones. So I do that. I run when I can run. Um, and you know, just the usual stuff. We got an active day. We have electricians here <laughs> yesterday, the house sprung a leak. So people were here drilling through drywall. So, uh there's always something going on we seem to accidentally keep busy yeah well it's life right you know just when you think you know i always joke around that just when you have all of life's answers somebody changes the questions you know and you gotta start all over again um yeah, but, but you can imagine for these skaters what it's been like and i was just texting with Lori nickel yesterday no oh, i love her like the complexity of getting the system going again and and how how, you know how expensive it is for some of the skaters to get ice time because of limitations on number of people. So um, I saw my friend Yevon Mock. I don't know if you remember Yevon. She's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, Yevon was a competitive skater and top top five at U.S. Nationals a couple times during Michelle's era. Mm -hmm. but she's a trainer now in the U.K. And she was doing jumps with towels under her feet and like sliding up into jumps with <laughs> towels, which yeah. is incredible. I mean, the creativity is great. Yeah, they did a lot of the stuff with, you know, like nylon stockings on the floor to kind of, you know, mimic sliding back and forth and getting into all of that. I actually went, you know, I had a lot of time on my hands, you know, because, you know, I've always been somewhat self unemployed, but now, really you know, so unemployed right <laughs> so we've been you know i i went through the garage because we moved into this house um it'll be two years in august and honestly just sort of have been camping here you know it's it's been one of those things where we had a lifetime of boxes stacked up in the garage that just were just sort of there mm -hmm. and it was kind of like well you know i probably have time now to kind of just do that so i spent a few weeks in the garage and the stuff I found was, I mean, it was gold, all the stuff that I found. And one of my, my favorite little nuggets of it, I found a slide board that I, I, I looked all over the place for, and it was under a box behind another stack of boxes. 
and it was just I wore that thing out for the first few days of just getting on it and just having fun that with it. Slide back and forth. Yeah, yeah. I love it. Oh man, I <laughs> love those slide boards. And they're so cheap, you know. It's just like you get just we. I found one. I ordered it. I got it in like two days, and and then when I started training on it, and it's just a whole different movement than what you do if you're running or you know doing any other kind of activity because ice is different because you're loading up that muscle and you're staying there for a long period of time and so we just started incorporating that into my workouts i had a, a guy i started working out when i first moved to nashville i'd go to the gym work out with him and then he started coming to my house and and now we just do facetime calls and he'll just work me out you know and i'll just do it on facetime got my earbuds in and here we go rocking oh, and rolling awesome. Yeah. yeah awesome. So um, I want to talk about you. Congratulations. I'm sorry Thank I couldn't you. go all the way to Thailand. I know <laughs> it was far, but we missed you. We missed you there. It and looked amazing. I saw the coverage on people.com and it just looked beautiful and, and congratulations. A few days. Thank you very yeah. much. Tell me about her. I don't, I don't, I've never met her. So tell me about her. Oh, um, she's incredible. Just the best, the, the absolute best person. And we were introduced about 10 years ago, just after uh, I finished Dancing with the Stars. Some good friends of mine from here in LA uh, went to Thailand for New Year's. And they had a friend who is family with my wife's family. Mm -hmm. And so they met her and they came home and they said, we met your wife. <laughs> no pressure <laughs> yeah, they said, you know I said how was your trip and they said our trip was good we met your wife we're 100% sure <laughs> and so they set us up at first they said she's coming to LA we met your wife and she's coming to LA and she's coming to America and so they set us up and we went on our first date which was like a group date good uh, no pressure yeah it's good no pressure but we were the first two to arrive so like we had our own alone time right away. We clicked right away. But I was so dumb and I was asking her all these questions because my friend said she's coming to America like her first time. Uh, and so I said, what do you think of America? And she said, it's, you know, I like it. And then I said, well, do you like LA? She's like, yeah, I love LA. And I was like, oh, great. What have you seen here? And she said, what have I seen? I mean, I've seen a lot. I, I've seen, what have you seen? And I said, I, well, no, I mean, have you seen the important stuff? And like, have you, you know, been to Hollywood? Have you been to Beverly Hills? And she's like, I've lived here for 15 years. <laughs> like, I've lived in LA for 15 years. So yeah, I've seen some stuff. Um, but, we, you know, my, my life was still really crazy at that time i was traveling around the world and i was trying to jump back into competition shortly after we were connected and um frank had moved from here in la up to lake arrowhead again so i was commuting i would train a lot of days i'd train here in la in the morning with karen kwan and then um one of my sponsors this amazing company called national air cargo owned by Lori and chris alf they would yeah. fly me on one of their helicopters from Van Nuys Airport up to Lake Arrowhead, <laughs> land in the church parking lot in Lake Arrowhead and go train Frank from like 8 to 10 p.m. and then come home. So things are crazy. Anyway, long story short. Yeah, I, you know, like I'd always go to my coach in a helicopter. <laughs> well, no, that never really happened to me. So. <laughs> oh, my God. I, this, I mean, if there was ever a reality show, the nuns from the church would come out and film the landing in the church parking lot. They thought I was out of my mind. They thought I was insane. So she thought I was insane too. Anyway, so yeah. <laughs> and I, then I moved to New York and I started working in New York and we always kept in touch. And then just two years ago, we decided we're going to make it work. And she's yeah. a real estate developer, uh, both here in the U.S. and in Thailand. Uh, so she has some really exciting projects going on back um, at the beach in Thailand. And then nice. she just finished building the house that we're living in now. And it's for sale. Uh, but she she's so talented. So fun. Everything's for sale. Everything Everything's for sale. For sale. <laughs> Especially real estate. Make yeah. me an offer. 
you know, yeah. we're just right oh, here in the middle yeah. of Brentwood. I can be know. out in an hour. No problem. <laughs> Here's the key. Give me an hour. Have a yeah. coffee and come back. Wow. So, you know, it's, it feels like, I mean, it's like in a really weird way, I, like, I feel like I watched you grow up, you know, in yeah. the sport and, <laughs> and it was just like, I had my time and, and, you know, it's really funny that when, uh, and it, it's, I, it struck me this way the other day, like when I, when I was doing all my skating, Dick Button was the guy that was doing all the broadcasting, right? And I always thought, man, he's just, his Olympics was like, whoa, wow, that was like a long time ago. And, you know, it was a whole different era and all that. And then, like, I became that guy. You know, <laughs> I would be broadcasting, like, in the Nationals and the Olympics. And it was, like, so far past mine. And, and it was like, you know, I had all this, this history that I'd witnessed and all this, you know, these friends that, and, and skating, you know, honestly is about like that big, you know, it's like half the size of your pinky nail because everybody that. knows everybody and their business and everything. But watching you come up was really different. Like there was just something different about you. And, you know, with, with skating, it's like showbiz and it's like this, you kind of were like more like you were, you're, your lane was really narrow, the way you approach your skating and the way that you trained. I think a lot of our, our, our skaters, I don't know if, if that was just my image of you, but I'd love to, you know, kind of those first years, especially when you got into skating, what were those like? Yeah, well, let me rewind and just react to one thing. So my wife knows nothing about skating. So I've been <laughs> showing her videos and she loves, she loves, love, loves skating. Now she loves watching it. We watched the whole last season uh, as it happened on I some of the ISU feeds from abroad. Um, but going back and watching some footage and, and past Olympics and hearing your commentary, I, I have a whole new appreciation. I mean, oh. you're so good at giving context and building excitement and, and, and stressing yeah, importance where you. you should and, and highlighting what's really difficult and might look easy. easy um, Excuse me, but you're just so good, Scott. I miss seeing oh, you. Oh, thank you. Hearing your voice. So what an impact you've had after, you know, your competitive career. What an impact you've had on viewers. Because my wife now knows you. She, she's like, oh, Scott. <laughs> oh, I can't wait to meet her. That's awesome. So, well, thank you. I mean, that's like awesome. incredible praise. You know, it just, but again, it's like, I, I let's just, I want to go like, it was, I want to go right to, you know, um, and we can, we can just, this is, you know, our last Friday conversation. You're like our big finale. And normally I kind of like to go through things sort of logically, but why? I mean, yeah, well, just... so I started skating when I was eight years old. I was really an active kid. My parents felt like sports were very important and would keep my sister. I have two sisters, one older, one younger would keep us out of trouble, which it did. <laughs> I did a different sport every day of the week. Seven days a week, I was I was doing sports. And I what were you doing? What else did you do besides skating? I did everything: karate, soccer, baseball, basketball, uh, track and field, everything. The only thing I didn't do, I never learned golf. I never learned tennis until later in life, and skiing. Mm -hmm. And these are the sports. I mean, tennis and skiing, I love. I really yeah. love. I know you're a golfer. That's um, so anyway, I started skating, uh, accidentally. My parents signed me up for lessons and it was right around the, um, Tanya Harding, Nancy Kerrigan. Oh yeah. That's a great time to start before, skating. Yeah. Before that. So I started skating and I knew what skating was when that was all unfolding. And I don't remember it so well, but I just remember the excitement around skating in, in the early nineties. Uh, and you know, I hated it. I just really despised it. And I was terrible. I couldn't stand up. I started on double blades. You know, you remember? Yeah, that? yeah, yeah. So did I. Yeah. So I was just bad. <laughs> and, and I told my mom, I want to quit. I don't like skating. Can I do something else on Saturdays? I, I just don't like it. And she said, why don't you like it? And I said, because Laura, my older sister, because she's better than me at skating. And I, I don't, I don't want to skate with her. <laughs> and she was always um, very like 
all, first of all, natural at all sports, but also concentrated and more quiet. And I was like all over the place and I just wanted to run or go fast or like kick the ball no matter which direction I was kicking it. So my mom said, if someone's better than you at something, you have to work harder than them. So mm. it comes naturally. Good lesson. Laura, okay, yeah. but, it, but maybe not so much to you, but you have to work harder. And if you get better than your sister, then you can quit. Mm -hmm. So I really did. I took it to heart. I paid attention. I listened to the instructor. I tried. I mean, I was working on basic stuff like swizzles and lunges, but she was right. I got better. And then I got better and better and better. And then once I could go fast and, and before yeah. our group class, there were like five the minutes. Set. Yeah, three right. times. Yeah. <laughs> I was yeah. up. And then I loved it and the speed and the quiet of it. And it's still, I miss it every day. But um, then I loved skating. I really, I really fell in love with it. And I think I started to learn to love uh, that it was an individual sport. And maybe at first I wasn't used to it, but then then I loved that aspect of it. Yeah, it's kind of great. You know, it's like uh, I, my little guy was a hockey player, um, kind of decided maybe this year he wants to step away. Yeah, the whole team idea of just being on a bad team and, you know, uh, you know, coaches making other players responsible for somebody's bad choice. And, you know, it's like, the individual sport thing is, is kind of great because as Vern Lankos would say, they're alone on the ice for the next, you know, four and a half minutes. And, That's and it's sink or swim, baby. It's like this, this right. What's going to happen now is a product of all the work that preceded it, all of it, starting with those first, you know, days and double runners. And, and it's amazing how that adventure just sort of takes on life as it starts to blossom. And, you know, you, you know, Chicago is, is a great figure skating area. A lot of really amazing skaters came out of the Chicago area. And Chicago Skating Club was always a really powerful club. The ISI started in Chicago with Michael Kirby. I mean, Chicago is a really big epicenter for figure skating and lots of rinks, tons of rinks. But of growing things. up in that, I mean, it must have been, were there other boys around that you would compete with or skate with that you were aware yeah. of? Uh, and what, you know, you sort of prefaced this before, but skating is a, a tiny, tiny little subculture of the sports world. And, and yeah. uh, <laughs> I grew the, the people I started, some of the skaters I started with, I grew up uh, either training with or competing with nearly my entire career. Wow. And ass would, you know, sort of drift apart and come back together and, you know, one of the, the guys that I started skating with when I was very, very young wound up coming to LA to train with Frank for a couple summers. And oh, wow. You, know, you just, you sort of keep seeing the same people. And it, it does make it feel like a, a bit of a family. Like, you know, I sort of always yeah. felt like I had my skating family and, and you were yeah. a part of it. I remember when I was, when I was first starting and you would come with Stars on Ice mm -hmm. to, um, I forget what it used to be called. Uh, Rosemont Horizon. Rosemont Horizon. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I got to meet you and you skated to walk this way. And <laughs> autograph. And, oh my God. It was just the best day of my life. And I kept the book with your signature open on my dresser. And oh man. Every day. So I think there, there, there's sort of like layers to, uh, it, what influenced me growing up. I think I was influenced by Chicago, like you said, and, and a, a lot of depth in skating and feeling like skating was a very important sport in, in that area. But I also felt like I had so much influence from my idols, you know, and, and also, you know, I've been watching Last Dance. I'm sure a lot of people have been watching right. and following that show. But that's when I was starting to skate in the 90s and the Bulls were amazing. And yeah. I watched this incredible... I don't know even what to call him, like a unicorn or a creature, this incredible, incredible athlete that led on and off the field of play and just w was such a leader and talked about, you know, responsibility. And he said, I make my bed every day and I, I, you know, I do my chores and that structure in my own life transfers over into my sport. And I, I, I'm the same now. I learned yeah. that I've, I've always acted that same way.
just like isn't life. it amazing like you know just what creatures of habit we get into you know throughout you know kind of these talks it's like you know talking to boitano and you know how he always like did everything exactly the same every single time and and yeah. nathan chen how he did everything the same all the time and how that just built the consistency and built that kind of it was almost like this foundation that he could almost build any kind of structure on and you're in real estate so you know kind of what that means right the foundation is everything, everything. and you you were really founded with the right stuff it was like make good choices be accountable do these things and it was great that you were able to be accessible to um role models that would, would just sort of show you something and say this is the way to go if you do it that way you're probably going to be okay and yeah, and you know for a lot of our you know young skaters you know they're kind of looking for identity they're looking for you know it's like where do i belong in all of this and how you know what is what is evan's career mean to me and and you know it's those lessons that you can share that really allow them to you know it's like who would have thunk right it's like everything about my story is completely unlikely like everything about it's unlikely and if you take a step back on yours and you see you know sort of the when the how the who the why the where and you kind of like and you're looking it's like you know how many things just had to line up for me to kind of you know do this thing? i think all the time i i always say it would never happen again yeah. you know one in a million in in 20 years as an elite or, or as a competitive athlete i don't think one time in one single competition i was the best skater and i'm a realist so i can admit i would look around me and say these guys are way better and i would admire them and say bravo well, for, you for that and bravo for that but i never doubted that i could win and, and so i think through hard work, of course, but all skaters work hard through dedication and perseverance. All skaters are, are determined and they persevere through challenges. You know, these are sort of the basics, but I think it was that belief that no matter what I could win. And when I would observe my competitors, I was never comparing. I was never saying, okay, well, you're better than me there, but maybe I'm better than you here. Compare to me, there's a phrase I didn't make it up. It's a famous phrase like, compare despair. It goes yeah. for skating, it goes for life, it goes for social oh, media, it goes for anything. Yeah. But you, you worry about yourself. What do you have to do? Do you want to win? I mean, that's the question. If you don't want to win, I, you know, I'm not the one to, to give you advice. But if you want to win, what do you think you have to do to win? And for me, it was about consistency. It was about being prepared. I knew that I felt nervous when I was young. I would be nervous to compete and I would make mistakes that I never made at home. So I thought, okay, what do I have to combat here? I have to combat nerves. And what makes me feel less nervous? Preparation. So when I, when I would go out to compete and I wasn't sure what would happen, then I felt nervous. If I was sure that I knew what was gonna happen when I got on that ice to compete, I wasn't nervous. I was still anxious. I would look at my watch and say, okay, I want it to be time. I want to go. I want to go. I want to go. I felt anxious, but not nervous. Nervous to me was like sort of the unknown. And I yeah. knew I was ready. I knew I hit that, you know, triple, whatever, 100 out of 100 times. And yeah. I was going to hit it when I got out there when the pressure was on. And it's funny because for a lot of our little ones, they're sitting there 100 out of 100 times. That's like, that's, I, that, that's not me. That, that, I can't do that. And it's like, well, no, no, no. Not today. Not today. But yeah. It's it's you an it's kind of an it. aspiration, right? It's kind of like you work toward that, and pretty soon you're like, "Wow, I did uh, ten out of ten today, and did it in my run through, and like that was clean too, and I'm not really missing anymore." It's like, "Wow, I I like I there here's a destination that's part of the journey, right?" But it's just all those little, you know, kind of stops along the way where you kind of go, oh, wow, I've come this far. And it's, it's, that's kind of what I want our, our, our skaters to know is that it takes time and repetition and doing all the right steps, but it's also being accountable to yourself and to, to learn from everyone around you, not compare because compare is despair. And you're right. You know, it's like, well, I'm not as, I can't do that person is 
you know, I mean, I, when I competed, it was like David Santee, the year that I came in ninth out of nine at novice nationals, he was 12 years old on the podium at senior nationals, 12 years old because he was great at figures, something that I despised, <laughs> you know, so if it's like, I mean, both, man, I, Just imagine if they ever brought that back, <laughs> I might still have a chance, um, but you know, it's, Ooh. it's that, it's like, really building up your fortress of being able to when you step on the ice know you're going to be okay really know that you're going to be okay well you said something i like the number that you use 10 10 so start with 10 mm -hmm. I, that's what i started with always and when i first moved to la uh i had just graduated high school and my parents said uh you know college 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 education of course and i mm -hmm. begged and pleaded with them and, and said, I'd like to try to make the Olympics in 2006. A lot of kids take a gap year or um, even a semester off. Can yeah. I please start with a semester and train and see if I can make the Olympics? And so they said, yes. And I said, well, I'd like to, and they said, make a list of the, the trainers that you wanna train with. And, and so I listed uh, a few, that I really respected and, and liked a lot. And I had skated with Kathy Casey quite a bit, but she was mm. in a sort of transition and, and wasn't really taking students on. So the top of my list was Frank Carroll. And so I called, I went and sat in my parents' bedroom and I, I like sat on the floor and leaned against their bed and, and called Frank Carroll on the yeah. telephone that was wired to the wall still back yeah. then. And I said, I don't know if you know who I am, but my name's Evan and I met you at a U Team USA camp and you helped me with my triple flip. And I, I'm finishing high school and I wanna come in and, may, and will you be my coach? And so he, Frank sort of chuckled and he said, well, first of all, thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> of course, so, yeah, in gentlemanly he, fashion. He said, no, I have a <laughs> called Timothy Gable, who's your competitor. And you might have heard of him. He just placed third at the Olympics, but he said, I'm not taking any other senior men right now. Uh, and so I said, okay, and I was disappointed. And I went downstairs to my parents and they said, how did it go? And I said, well, he said, no, that he doesn't want to train me. And so they said, okay, well, you think of another coach and, and we'll call them. And, and so for a few days I was really down. And then I said, I just, I really want to train with Frank Carroll. I, I've seen him on TV when he, when he coaches Michelle Kwan and, and, and Timmy, and I think he's the right coach. And so my parents said, okay, well, let's call him back. And, and uh, a lady called Jan Serafin helped me. She yeah. was- Oh boy. Yeah, I remember old Jan, yeah. And said, let me call Frank first and, and see, and then, and then you call him. Yeah, so I try saying back. no to Jan, right? It doesn't work. <laughs> Not happening. So I called him back and I said, I know you said no to me, but can I, can I just come and skate at your rink? And then just, just um, maybe you can give me a lesson or two. And he said, what is your goal? He said, let me understand. What do you want from skating? Do you want to be a skater? Is that the life you want? Or you want to skate for a year and go do something else? And I said, well, I want to go to the Olympics in 2006. And he said, well, right now is we're starting the 2004 season and you're not even senior, you're junior. So you do <laughs> want to go from junior to senior and then make the Olympics in a year and a half. That's your goal, right? Yeah. And I said, yes. And he said, okay. He said, then if that's your goal, that's my goal. And he said, I can't be your coach, but you can come here. The rink is open. You can skate as much as you want. And he said, when you get here, we'll talk about lessons and I can give you some lessons. So that I moved to LA. I drove across. Door was open that much, right? Door was open that much. I drove <laughs> across the country and went to the rink and I got four 20 minute lessons a day with Frank. They were wow. on the last session of the day, an open session that had a maximum of like 35 people that had kids wow. with helmets on learning swizzles. And I had already skated four hours by then. Yeah. And the ice was all chewed up. And that was yeah. my time with Frank. And 
I was so used to this other method where I had trainers that wanted to give me two hours of lessons a day and, and never wanted me to be on the ice without a coach supervising. And now I go to this great training center and I get 20 minutes and that's it. And Frank said, we only have 20 minutes and it's not a lot of time. There's not time for you to talk. So he said, when I tell you something, you just nod your head. If you're confused, we'll talk about it later. But he said, when I tell you to do something, you go and do it. And really it started almost like drills. He was like a drill sergeant. He'd give me drills, I'd go do it. I'd come back, I'd go do it, I'd come back. And he never said good, he just said, okay. I'd do it, he'd yeah. say, okay. If it was bad, he'd, he'd critique. And I had to really, it, it totally changed my perspective because I had to basically train myself for four hours a day. And I started doing these drills. So I would say, all right, I'm missing my triple loop. And so I'm going to do my triple loop 10 times in a row. And if I miss, I start over. So not Ooh. only was I training repetition on that element. Yeah, you're also getting your adrenaline up and putting a little pressure on yourself. I like it. Pressure. So I was dealing with pressure and I was learning how to say, okay, I'm exhausted. I've restarted this five times. I think I'm at 55 triple loop attempts now and I still can't get to 10. I started to sort of correct and act like a cat, like figure out how I could land on my feet and get through these drills and get through 10 in a row. And um, it was important for me. And then also training on ice, it was very crowded taught me about run throughs because yeah. I would get on the ice and rush over to the, you know, then it was a CD player and put my <laughs> CD in line. And some days I'd be eighth in line and some days I'd be second in line. Yeah. And no matter what, where I was in my training, when my CD came up, I wasn't going to miss my chance to do my run through. So it's sort of at any time I had to snap it on and be able to do my run through. And Later on, even, I started to do more run throughs So I would put three CDs in a row just so I could get my place in line. And I wasn't going to miss any chance for my music. So I'd end up doing three run throughs, you know, in a half hour or 45 minutes. And I loved it. And I thought three is better than one. Five is better than three. Eight is better than five. And I just started learning, okay, you know, I'm a skater. And when I get out to compete, I don't have to do, you know, a spin that lasts for a minute and a half and I don't have to do 10 triple axles in a row. All I have to do is my run through with my music for four and a half minutes. So that's the most important thing I'm going to train. So smart. I mean, that's it. I mean, it's, you know, we can, I, you know, I trained um, uh, the going into the 79 season. I know you weren't even born yet, but um, it was one of those things where I'm watching Robin Cousins you know, and he's doing parts of the program. Like he would do a part of the program, go back and re and he was all into kind of the art and the choreography of it. But I was watching, I was going, that doesn't really work. Cause you know, now how's he gonna do it? Like when it comes out. So I left after that season, I went to Philadelphia to take from Don Laws and then at the Olympics, you know, we're all at the Olympics in 1980. And I realized there <clears throat> that like, I, I could do a five minute program like like because I trained it every day competition pressure he he never really trained like that and so when it came time to the Olympics he'd always make kind of the mistake right or he would get to a certain point in the program and and it wasn't quite like that he didn't have that next gear to kind of be able to rise up to that situation and I mean he was a phenomenal talent incredible skater to this day one of the greats of all time and it's just like his method of training was so different than anyone else's. He was relying on his, on his natural ability and his performance to get through a program where your approach was much more blue collar, right? It was like, I'm just going to grind it out, get the work done. I'm just going to grind it out. Today's another day to grind it out. I'm going to get it. I'm going to make sure that I, I check every box and here, I'm, I'm just going to respond. And the most important thing is when I, when that music starts at competition, there's no doubt. There's no doubt. I mean, I'm just ready to go. And, and under any circumstance, you know, yeah. Orser used to do that. He would warm up for six minutes and then he'd go sit in the lobby for 30 minutes of the session and then come back cold and do a run through because he wanted to simulate what it was like to do that. And I was like, eh, I'm not going to do that. that I'm just going to do my run through. Brilliant, brilliant, but very, very hard. 
I yeah, know. extremely hard. But those are the ones, the, the athletes that are willing to do what you do, that are willing to kind of go to that level, are probably going to be in a better position to be successful, even if they're, you know, it's like, I, I remember, oh my goodness, it was just endless. You know, you, it's, you know, every Olympics we get to the greatest of all time. It, this greatest of all time. Evgeny Plushenko is the greatest of all time. And it was like, well, you're still comparing him to Dick Button. Sorry, but you know, you're going. Same, same tricks, but 50 years ago. Yeah. It's a stretch, a right? Suit, it's in a, a three piece suit. <laughs> yeah. And outdoors, right? Outdoors, yeah. 30 degrees, it's right? After. It's like, you do that. Yeah. Oh <laughs> but it's God. like, I hear, you know, all these conversations, but the group of guys that you came up with, I mean, just name them. Our, our guys are going to, they're going to know every single one of them. Your main posse of competitors in that time were? Oh, at, at Olympics in 2010, there were, I think, five world champions in the group. Stefan Lambiel, Brian Joubert, Evgeny Plushenko, Daisuke Takahashi. Um, there's more. But even going back to 2006 on the national level, I mean, those names. Yeah, uh, Michael Weiss, Todd Eldridge. I competed still with Todd Eldridge, uh, Johnny Weir. Ryan Bradley. Ryan Bradley. I mean, just an incredible group. Jeremy Abbott. Incredible group, Jeremy Abbott. Incredible group. And I guess to the point you made earlier, I didn't have the choice ever to rely on natural ability or to rely on talent. So the only way that I could prepare was to sort of grind it out. And I think I would look at at my competitors and see immense talent. Um, And and again, I'm a realist. It was talent I didn't really have. I wasn't the most natural. My body's not made for skating. Of course, I'm six, almost six foot two. Yeah, you know, that's not, not good for skating. It's it wasn't like, like made for skating. <laughs> and, no. um, and so I think I had no choice but to work really hard. And you said about gears and finding gears. And I feel like training the way that we did, the, the way that you train and the way that I train, all of a sudden it kind of becomes, I hate to say it because skating is so hard. It's the hardest sport but the act of doing what you know how to do over the course of four and a half minutes, which seems very daunting when you first learn your routine and you're training at it. Right, five. <laughs> your legs are like, they feel like each leg weighs 10,000 pounds. Yeah. Once you're, once you're ready and once you're trained, you find another gear. You find like eighth gear that you can switch on and halfway through the program, you're not tired and you're like, you, you feel even better than at the beginning. And before the system, the judging system changed because, you know, I'm of the generation that knew the 6.0. So I came up with a 6.0 halfway through my senior skating career. It switched over and we had to adapt and sort of scramble and learn. But even before the change, I was putting more jumps in the second half because I felt better. I felt more warmed up and I felt more confident and the blood was flowing. And, um, you know, it was if you don't ever train that way doing a triple lutz after two and a half minutes of nonstop skating spinning footwork jumping it doesn't feel the same as when you're there it it, (laughs) it might as well be a completely different jump true yeah mechanics and and the way that you you use your fast twitch muscles and explode off the ice it's totally different so i'd rather know the triple lutz after two and a half minutes the know the one after you know light skating for five minutes yeah and so that's the triple lutz that i trained more was you know the one that was in the program because i wow I it's totally different elements well and, and you're right and and knowing that you have that ability gives you the confidence to step out under any circumstance and just when you get to that two and a half minute point and your legs are just you know a little bit wobbly and not firing you know it's like that that quick thing that they're doing in the beginning of the program you know that i this is how it feels and this is how it works and this is how i can i know it's i'm gonna land it i i want to um quickly because it was so powerful for me um and i i always go back to you know it's like what's your favorite moment of 2006 olympics and it was your long program 
because of it no i mean it came out of such unbelievable circumstances you know um i mean talk about you know kind of all that build up to the short program and everything that you were enduring at that time because it was uh, uh, insurmountable for many athletes well unfortunately there's one narrative that's not great at the Olympics and it happens to a lot of athletes and it happens to me. It's the worst case scenario that you can't plan for and you can't train for. And it's that you get sick and you're in the Olympic village. There is a lot of people and a lot of germs coming from all around the world into this tiny little, you know, yeah, yeah, a bubble. And now we know how quickly and easily viruses and, and germs and bacteria can spread. And, and COVID has made us all hyper aware. But then, you know, it was the last thing I was thinking of. So I ended up having a pretty rough couple of weeks in Torino. And I couldn't have been more excited. I couldn't have been more, uh, you know, shocked in, in a lot of ways that, that I did, you know, make that jump and qualify for, for that yeah. Olympic team in 2006. And I got there with high hopes. I was, you know, I was eyeing the podium. I, I don't think mm-hmm. anyone goes into Rightfully the- so. Oh yeah. God, I, will, uh, I, I don't really know if I want to get on the podium. I'll just, you know, I, I, I had my eye on the podium, whether it was realistic or not. Um, but then I got sick and uh, I tried to suppress it. And I tried to say, I'm not sick. This is, you know, this isn't happening. This, this sort of nightmare is not happening. Uh, but it, you can't stop it. And so uh, it made my body feel totally different. And so I, I didn't feel the way that I had trained and I felt really loose. And, and it, it's, it's what you feel when you're sick. You know, I was dizzy and I had a headache and I had muscle aches and I had a fever. And um, so in the short program, I think my mindset was completely wrong. It was that I was going to like... I was going to like muscle, muscle through and will it to happen. And like, even if I feel sick, I'm going to give it 200%. And it was totally the wrong. Yeah. It was like, <laughs> yeah, like squeezing. <laughs> just totally wrong. Yeah. And Cause you don't train that, that way. Right? right. Yeah. What's that? You don't really, I mean, you don't train with that clenched fist, right? You're, right, you're, exactly. you're, you're intense in your training, but you're not like, forcing the issue you're really just you know going through and and training your body to do it a certain way yeah and i think it it, you know like metaphorically but literally it made me very heavy because i was just like so tense that my whole force was like down into the ice instead of up and light and jumping and um so the shore was a disaster and i right when it was over i just had a meltdown like emotional meltdown and, and i I had to get out of there, get out of the arena. And I missed the practice day in between the short and the free skate. I just, I wasn't well enough even to, to get out of bed. Uh, so I was in the medical, like a makeshift medical clinic in the Olympic Village getting intravenous fluids. And they were trying to give me anti nauseants just to, to at least allow my body to be hydrated. And, yeah, I still, and you can't take medicine because the doping and everything else just prevents you from taking anything that's going to open you up or right, get exactly, you. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and my, my issue was really stomach more than anything. Yeah. Uh, I just was so dehydrated and I just could not stop. I was, I was so sick and I couldn't stop throwing up. Uh, and so I had no idea if I was going to skate the, the next day or not. And I think at one point I said to Frank, I really want to just go home. I don't want to skate tomorrow. I can't do it. I want to go home. <laughs> I'm really glad you did. <laughs> said, okay, no problem. He said, we can get you home. He said, honestly, he said, no one will even remember. He said, they'll only remember who won or lost. They won't remember if you go out there and skate anyway. So he said, why don't you just go home? If this doesn't mean anything to you, being here representing your country. Ooh. You got these spots and other skaters had to stay home for you to be here. And he wasn't even stern. I'm being even more yeah. stern now than he was at the time. Yeah. But really, the only people that care are you and me because we're the only ones that know what went into this. So he said, no problem. He said, let me go and talk to some people. And I laid there for a minute and I laid there. And then I said, Frank, 
<laughs> and he came back and said yes and i said i think i, I think i'm gonna try to skate tomorrow and so he said it's up to you you have to be sure he said you, you, you're not gonna try you're either gonna go skate tomorrow or you're not gonna go skate tomorrow but you should decide right now so i said okay I'm, I'm gonna skate tomorrow so i went out um the next day on the warm-up, you know, there it was only for 20 minutes. You get a 20-minute warm-up before yeah. the, the competition. Generous. It just felt like <laughs> I was on Mars. I was like, the whole the lights are so bright and you can hear cameras flashing and everything. And like I felt like really wild. And so I just stroked around and I did some single jumps and I did a few spins to make sure that I could spin. And then I got off. And again, in the six minute warm up, I sort of did as little as possible. And then whatever Frank kind of said to me, uh, you know, whether it was true or not, that no one really is that concerned with what I'm doing sitting in 10th place, uh, that it was more just about, you know, me representing my country and sort of doing the job I went there to do, which was to skate. I felt more at ease and I skated well. I mean, I, I had the opposite mentality as a short program. I just sort of let it happen. It was like, okay, I'm trained. My body's either going to remember that training or it's going to totally not. And <laughs> after, but either way, just sort of let it like a free for all, let it go. Um, and when I was done, I went. I walked back into the, this little locker room that I was in because I was trying to avoid the other skaters because I didn't want to get them sick. So yeah. I was in my own room, like a broom closet almost, just staying away from everyone, keeping my germs to myself. And I curled up and went to sleep. And all this, the, the skaters kept going and kept going and kept going. And then Frank came in and he said, the last group's about to go on. Do you want to go and watch the, the last six skaters? And I said, yeah, let's go watch, let's go out. And I walked up to where my family was sitting and I walked out uh, into the arena and I looked up as they were warming up and I was still in first place. <laughs> After, like, I think maybe 12 or 13 skaters had gone since me. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. And it was, it was wild. And then I remember, you know, of course I thought, okay, maybe there's a chance now. Oh my God, I couldn't believe it. Is there really a chance that I could be on the podium? And I didn't, I finished um, in fourth place behind Jeff Buttle. There's another one. Mm -hmm. I forgot to mention Jeff Buttle before, but yeah. an amazing guy, amazing skater. Oh, phenomenal. Yeah. And, and then seeing, you know, Stefan Lambiel and... Uh, Jeffrey Buttle and I didn't know Plachenko as well. I idolized him, but I didn't know it. he he was like another level for me at the yeah. time. I didn't know him as well. But watching <laughs> at least two of the three guys that I really yeah. knew and had grown up competing with climb on the podium and cry and and see their nation's flag rise and and feel the weight of the medal around their neck and sort of feel that justification for a really crazy life where people yeah. tell you the whole, you know, your whole career, this probably won't happen for you. You think you're going to be the one, the one person? This is, I don't know. I don't know. You're from a little town in, in Chicago. And these people, they train in LA and they train in Moscow and they train in Zurich. <laughs> Why would you? And seeing them be able to justify all those doubts, I knew I wanted that. I wanted that feeling more than the medal, more than the achievement, more than the name on, on a list. I wanted that feeling and I would do anything to get it. And so that sort of shaped the next four years of my life. Knowing well, I mean, it, it was remarkable. I mean, I, I remember just the difference between short and long there. And it was just such a Phoenix type moment. You know, it's like you were at the lowest of the low and then you're, you're like this far from the podium. And it's like, comeback of the century. Right. And it was a really cool Olympics. You know, it's, I, I kept, you know, I, every now and then I, I, in my broadcasting, I always want to give the skaters, you know, all the glory and all the, you know, all the accolades and everything they deserve. But I, I you know, with Pashenko that year, it's like, where's the program? 
it just can, you know, going end to end, just jumping end to end and, and front loaded and then nothing really after. And it was like, where's, the, and, and he won. And I remember Ari Zakarian, you know, Ari, you know, I call him Ari Net because he had like eight phones Ari. going out. He's time. hysterical. He's yeah, like, Ari said, don't go to Moscow. He said, yeah, what? I, I, he said, don't go to, don't go to Moscow. You're not popular right now in my country. And I go, really? Why? And he goes, because of what you said about Guinea. I go, I, you know, anytime anybody would criticize me, it would make me a better skater. So I don't know what his deal is. He goes, well, mission is basically put a contract on your life, you know, and all this other stuff. And it's like, lighten up, right? So going into the next four year cycle, you know, it's at Guinea's this, at Guinea's that, and, Guinea, and I explained it, you know, in a way that, you know, when you do that, uh, if you can, if you build that relationship with judges, you know, and you make them look good and you make them right. And you, you know, you really put them in a position to be successful. And a lot of people don't think of it that way, but if you put the judges in a position to be right, successful, they don't have to write any letters. They don't have to explain their marks. They don't have to do anything. They're yeah. grateful. And <clears throat> again, he did that for a long time. So then you go through that next four year period and, and your skating is, a, is setting like cement, right? It, you're like, you know, um, what, you know, your triple axle, you know, it went from here to here, you know, your jumps were carrying more speed, footwork sequences were really super intricate. And you took the IJS and you mastered it in a way that no one else had really mastered it before. Fair. Um, you're very nice to say that. I, I mean, I want to say about Yevgeny, uh, you're right. He was the best, no doubt, by far, for so many years. Uh, and we, we touched on a little bit the challenge of going from the 6.0 system to the IJS system. Uh, but it was really hard. And a whole group of skaters that were at the top in my generation just dropped right out. They, 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 they couldn't reconfigure the their skating. Yeah, they couldn't and read. Plushenko having a formula that worked without a doubt, and then layering on top of that the pressure that comes with being the best, with being the world champion over and over and over, and then having to change and completely retool everything you know about the sport, but still be expected to win. Yeah. You have to yeah. change everything, but you yeah. still have to be the best, even with all <laughs> the changes. You have to be better at changing than anyone else. I think it was, it's an immense amount of pressure that could have made a lot of skaters and a lot of great competitors crumble. And so, you Not know, him. The, the way that he adapted, and also there were, challenges when this was all new different countries interpreted all the rules in a different way there was no <laughs> uniform way of interpreting it none of us yeah. knew i would go to competition and see spins i had never thought of and say oh wow maybe they're right maybe i <laughs> didn't understand it. maybe they're the ones that are right so yeah. you know i think for him to be able to change and still win and still be the best and still do clean programs you know, whether they were totally IJS friendly or not, but I, I no, you know, he's always amazing. You're yeah. like amazing. Yeah. For I'll me, take nothing I, away from him. I'm, I'm just, I, I didn't, you know, the, the no, main thing not, was. What you're saying is totally true. You're, you're observing as a commentator and you're a very thoughtful commentator that expresses to an audience why one thing is harder and one thing is maybe not as hard. One thing's more complex. Uh, one thing is maybe more by the rules. Another is not. And I think an audience deserves to hear all of that. Yeah. And they make their own judgment who you think is the best. They might still say, I don't care what you said, Scott. He's the best one he should have won. And that's their opinion. But for the judges, to your point, it comes down to just like data. I mean, our whole lives are data now. It comes down to like add, the computer adds it up for you. You just grade it in real time. And then you don't know who you thought was the best. The computer tells you who you thought was the best. And, and it's funny because back in the early days of the IJS, a score would come up and a skater would look at it and they'd look right over at their coach and they'd go, is that good? Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea. And the audience would go, uh, is, uh, I, I, think. Uh, I don't know. 
you know, there's all that drama, of the, you know, the five nine six zero, oh, and all that, you know, they can see it in real time and they can judge it themselves. And all of that kind of keeping score in the, in the, in the stands kind of like it was a muscle nobody had built yet. Right. So then <clears throat> you, you, go to LA, you win a world championship. Now you're going into the Olympics as the reigning world champion against the greatest skater of all time. Right. I mean, that was the whole deal. Right. And I remember yep. that we went to the first practice and again, and I, we got a, you know, we got a fine, we're got a good relationship. Whatever happened in 2006, we got past it really quick, you know? And I remember I was at that first practice and, um, and it was really funny. Okay, he was kind of, you know, going around, kind of marking his territory, as it were, <laughs> you know, kind of like establishing, Perfect. like, yeah. I'm the guy. And he saw me over, and he came over, and he, you know, shook my hand, and you know, it was great to see him. And it was like, hey, good luck this week, and everything else. And he, I don't, I don't think he saw any chance of not winning the gold medal if he skated even ninety percent. But what he didn't take into account was your mastery over the first time I think anyone in the skating to, uh, the IJS had ever gotten a level four footwork sequence. The first time, you know, you've gotten level fours in all your spins and he was pulling level twos and level ones. And I mean, you beat him fair and square, straight up. And that program I mean, was I mean, was there was there one thing in that program that you felt you could have done better on the night? Don't be greedy. Uh, so <laughs> I'll answer that then over one. Uh, yes, my second triple axel uh, when I took off, I thought it was going to fall, and my heart was like, <gasps> and so yeah. I landed with like a little dip. Uh, I guess you know you'd call it a balance check kind of, but I'm sure I got a minus one for execution. Um, but I smiled after when I watched it back, I never remembered, but after I watched it back and I smiled, <laughs> and I remember watching it with friends, um, with my friend, Aaron Andrews, when we were, uh, it was like, maybe we were on a TV show together or just after, and she's like, oh no, oh, Ev, oh, okay, good. You let, why, why'd you smile at that one? Because it was that a mistake. I said, yeah, why'd you smile? And I said, because I really thought I was going to fall. <laughs> and that was one of those moments that we talk about where if I hadn't done that triple axel one million times in practice, I would have fallen for sure. But somehow it was one of those drills where I had to do it 10 times in a row. And the 10th one, I thought, I'm not starting this over. And no matter what, you sort of find, yeah. find the right leg. It was one of those moments. So I smiled just like, Thank you for that. That was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But besides that, I felt like it, it was a good program. And, and uh, you know, the credit for the, the program goes to Lori Nickel and to Frank, okay. because Lori was the one that taught me, you know, I didn't, I didn't come up with a level four footwork sequence and I didn't come up with a way to do level four spin. They, they thought of all of that. Yeah. So, and then they taught me how to do it. And, and all I had to do was learn, but they had to think of it. So, uh, they deserve so much credit. Uh, Plushenko, it was either Plushenko or Alexei Mission, his coach, that accused me <laughs> after Worlds in 2009 when Plushenko knew he was going to come back. They accused me of manipulating the judging system. And, <laughs> uh, and, and there, there was this thing that I don't know if it still exists, but they were like talking or, or like uh, messaging sites online where people would go like skating fans and like- Yeah, write yeah, the blogging skating. stuff. Yeah, that was everywhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. before social media really like- Yeah, them. exactly. And they, they, that really stuck. And they said, I'm manipulating. He's manipulating the system, manipulating. Manip and so then it got all the way to Phil Hirsch and Christine Brennan. And they said, <laughs> being accused of manipulating the judging system. And I said, of, why? of course I'm manipulating. <laughs> Aren't we all? Isn't that the goal? Aren't we all trying to manipulate this system and get the most points we can? And, and, and I said, <laughs> my, my whole thing is, how can I minimize risk here? You know, I'm a, I've always been a business person. I'm now in business and I spent six years of my life analyzing contracts and, you know, trying to build in as, as much risk mitigation as possible. So I was like that in my career. 
how can I minimize risk and guarantee the greatest outcome, which was the largest score that I can get on things that I'm 100% certain of? I know that if I find a way to, you know, get a level four step sequence, that those are just sort of gimme points. Those are, you train it, it's hard, of course, it's hard to do, the stamina is hard. But once you you train it, you know that you're going to get that number. And I think a lot of skaters that I trained with were always hoping for the level, but they felt like there wasn't a way to guarantee it. And it was like, hold, hold your spin for eight revolutions, you get the level, you know, do that, whatever variation you're going to do, you get the level. And yeah. so that stuff to me just became, um, you know, the, that became the foundation to your point about foundation. Yeah. That was sort of the foundation for the program. And then the discussion about quad, not quad, quad, not quad, that was like, uh, you know, on the, on the 18th story of the building, that wasn't the yeah. foundation of the program. Yeah. And again, it just risk reward. You know, it just comes down to, and it, you know, Adam Rippon did that last Olympics. He said, risk reward. If I do quad lots and I miss it, if I do a clean program, you know, same score. So, you know, it's, it's understanding your skating, which you built so meticulously, methodically, and it's applying that to the night and, and what you really want to be able to, you want to dance with the date you brung and you want it to be as great as it can be. And I think this is, you know, I'll just say, you know, we've done a lot of these talks and I think if, if this one was super important because of just, again, you know, the whole idea of you being a 6'2 male figure skater. I mean, who, who's ever been 6'2 that won the Olympics, right? You know, but you, you did it right. You built your body. You did, but, you know, it's like, I'm five foot four. There was David Jenkins. You know, I knew it could be done, <laughs> you know, it's like, but it, it, it's how you build your skating and it's really showing up every day and it's putting, it's really that blue collar mentality and then presenting yourself in that way of just, you know, knowing with complete confidence that you can on the night, on a, on a really stressful night, you built your skating in a way that can withstand anything. And I think, you know, this was really important for our skaters to hear that and for our, our coaches to kind of understand that that's, you know, that that's the way, that's the path, that's, that's the set, that's the foundation, that's all of it. And then, I, I, you know, I'll just add on to that, you know, USOC Male Athlete of the Year in 2010. Great. I mean, there's a lot of great things that happened, you know, in that year and you, you were the top guy. And, and I'll tell you this, I, I was in my going through the garage, I found three plaques from the Sullivan Award, of which I lost all three of them you won the Sullivan Award. <laughs> so that is a great well, thank accomplishment you. Thank you. as I'm, well. What an honor. I still can't believe it. But what I was most excited about was that they were so eager to recognize uh, a male skater because yeah. I, I, you know, I think there's much more ba gender balance now. But uh, at the time, I never thought. I, I always thought, you know, the the female skaters were the stars and yeah me too always so i lost my first job in ice capades because the owner only wanted to present women so i get it you know we're always kind of there to kind of be the flash and the you know the wow factor but they're still the identity of the sport you know we can live with that that's okay uh, you know, we'll still have our moments but that was cool <laughs> that was cool of them and and um yeah i i looking i mean this talk has been amazing first of all thank you for having me it's making oh my pl oh you can skating I, I mean i i almost i i don't talk about skating that much and and wow. fun to to remember it's really it's been fun i just well, want to come to it oh Kevin, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. i i hopped on a little bit late but um evan seriously this is awesome thank you so much for joining us this Hi, is Corey. So it's Oh my so God, good. so cool yeah. to see you. You look, I, people in skating never age. It's the ice. You look like you're 15. <laughs> Thank you. I was actually aging until March 13th and then I had to start teaching classes online. So like, now you can't just stand around and tell people what to do. I'm like, oh my God, I'm so out of shape. I gotta actually do it. So I think <laughs> this has been really good for my health. So anyway, yeah. thank you. But seriously, to have two Olympic gold medalists, you guys, I knew this wisdom would be just like priceless. Uh, I know a lot of kids are going to hop on later because I, I, I made sure that they knew
that your wisdom is just so invaluable to them. And Evan, I want to say that I use you as an example all the time. You don't know this, but in, in classes, I talk about work ethic. And actually today's quote of the day in class was achieving your goal isn't the best part. And I use that example because I was like, you know, Evan has sort of become known for like the grind and being the guy that wants to show up and do the work, even when the medal is won. I don't mean to take this away, but anyway, I just wanted you to know that you are a huge inspiration for our skaters and, and skaters worldwide. So thank you so much for your time. And Scott, obviously, thank you so much for being here to facilitate this and make it happen. It's awesome. So fun. So hey, fun. Lori, can I say one thing to layer onto that? Uh, as I was preparing for the Olympics in 2010, I felt some pressure because I was going in as, as the world champion and, and uh, I, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to succeed and I wanted to achieve and get the medal, you know, achieve the goal. And I had some rough days where I was very emotional and I was, I was scared of what might happen if I didn't get the medal. And I think I let that fear maybe rise to the surface a little bit. And Frank stopped me one day when I was just, you know, he sort of couldn't get through to me. And, and he said, just look at me, look at me, look at me. And I looked him in the eyes and he said, I was a skater one time. Believe it or not, I actually did jumps and tricks. And, and he said, <laughs> as I look back at my career, I won competitions and I lost competitions. But what I remember the most were days like this, training days. And he said, you're going to go to the Olympics. You might win, you might lose. Whatever happens in 10 years when you look back at your life, you, what you'll remember the most fondly are these days at, at an empty ice rink, just you and me, and you're doing what you love. And it's so true what he said, because now when I look back, I remember the Olympics as like this, just like a firework, like just an explosion of excitement that went by so fast. And then it was kind of over and, and, you know, everything that I wanted, the justification for, for my life came true. But what I miss the most are those days, just kind of freezing cold, empty ice rink, silent, and just that first step onto the ice and gliding yeah. and feeling proud at the end of the day that I worked really hard. And it, my, my best advice to anyone, not, not just skaters, not just athletes, anyone that wants to achieve, there's no secret formula. You know, you can talk to, to a hundred Olympic gold medalists. You can talk to a hundred Wimbledon winners. I think they'd all say the same thing. The path to success is arduous, but it's the same for everyone. Hard work, you'll get where you want to go. It, it, you know, and that's, that's any walk of life. Uh, and that is the formula. And, and especially now, I think, with social media and, and technology and Everyone's sort of looking for a shortcut. They want a quick fix. Yeah, instant gratification, yeah. Yeah, and with sports, I mean, maybe in some things there's a way, but with sports, there's no way. The, the long way there is the best way. Yeah. Well, awesome. you are amazing, and you, you sure. earned it the old-fashioned sure. way, and uh, I'm just so proud to call you my friend, and please come to Nashville and build a great big building. Thank you. Oh, we will. Us. We will. We love <laughs> there's oh, thank there's you. still some land. And uh, yeah, I can, I can introduce you to the right people. We can get this okay. thing done. Yeah, uh, let's do this. Sounds good. Sounds good. All right, buddy. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks, Evan. Thanks, Evan. Thank this is awesome. Thank you. Happy birthday. Thank you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday.